just to start of this video, I really want to say a special thanks to Lenny and to Jakiris, who both helped me with this build and with our next build. Uh, those guys are really great. We've, we've talked to them on the stream here before, so hopefully you guys know who they are. But I just want to say that I really appreciate you guys' help, both with parses and, and just with everything. And if you're looking for some sweatier groups where people are not toxic or whatever, uh, go check out their Discord. And I'll try to remember to link it below. If I don't, just ping me and I'll, I'll, I'll link it below. Hey everyone, it's Nightharo here, and today I've got the Beam Arcanist build for you. So this is the meta setup for the Arcanist, or at least a meta setup for, for the Arcanist. Now this build, honestly, is probably one of the easiest and most simple builds that you can do right now. And the main reason for that is because the Beam on an Arcanist lasts for four and a half seconds. Just to give you an idea of how long that is, <laughs> compared to some other things, is that you're a heavy attack, you know, heavy attack builds, very accessible, very easy for everybody to use, only lasts for 1.8 seconds. So this is literally two and a half times longer with one skill that you have here. So this is much easier than many and maybe most other classes. The other thing that with this particular build today is that light attacks are gonna matter a lot less. You're just gonna need a light attack to get ultimate back, but because we're gonna be using the uh, Velothi or Mage Amulet, which reduces your damage done by light, light and heavy attacks, but increases your damage done with all your abilities that you you really only need to be light attacking you know once every nine seconds to make sure you're generating ultimate so it's really nice just a psa too for those who don't know please stop using heavy attacks <laughs> uh arcanist heavy attack builds apparently this is a thing uh people see people running around uh using the arcanist heavy attack just use the beam the beam is the way to go the beam the beam will guide you <laughs> all right so let's go ahead and talk about all of these skills and we'll pop up the card here so i'm actually going to run through this is a fairly simple set up compared to some of the other ones we've talked about on this channel. So I'm just going to walk through every single skill and including the flex spots here. So first up is we're going to have some sort of weapon skill from, from our weapon skill line. So in this case, I have Deadly Cloak. You could also use something like Poison Injection or really any other weapon skill. Now, the benefit of Deadly Cloak is that it will help make sure that our dagger enchants are always procced um, because it is one of the skills that does that. If you go with something like Poison Injection, it will not do the same thing, but as long as you're light attacking, you should be okay on those procs. But if you're someone who's like, hey, I really want this to not light attack, probably go with the daggers. It's going to be the best thing here. But again, anything you want to put here, you could. After that, it's going to be Cephaliarch's Flail. We use this as a way of generating crux. It's our primary method for generating crux. It also gives us an extra 5% damage on targets that have been hit by it. So that's also really nice and important to make sure that we keep up. But So we'll keep up the dot, but generally we'll be using it to generate crux so often that we'll already be kind of refreshing that debuff that we put on the target. After that, we have Exhaustive Fake Harbor. This is the beam, okay? <laughs> this is the core part of our build. Everything else is really built around the beam. And when we get to the gear section and kind of talk about some of that a little bit later, you'll see why that is and how, how significant the beam and the four and a half second channel, how that's changed a lot of the different setups on an Arcanist and why you don't want to run necessarily on an Arcanist setups that would work on literally every other class <laughs> or at least pretty well on every other class if not optimal like fairly close to it so uh, the exhaustive fate carver we want to make sure that we have three crux every single time we go to use this so again we use cephaliarch's flail and some other abilities we'll talk about on our back bar but try to get three crux and then use the beam you can block cancel this Hopefully you don't have to do that very often. You you know, for best DPS, you wanna make sure that you're using the beam. I will also note that like 40% of our damage comes from this one skill. And so if you are in trash, use the beam. It's an AOE, does tons of damage, no reason not to. So Feliarch's Flail, uh, once or twice, if you need to, to get, and then go ahead and beam, and that's gonna last for most of, most of the trash fight, if you're in an optimized group, of course. Then after that, we have Barb Trap. Barb Trap, typically minor force is a significant reason that we want to have Barb Trap in our bar, but we actually get that buff from a mythic item that we're going to be using, so it's a little bit less important that we keep Barb Trap up at all times. I will note Barb Trap takes a second and a half to arm, so you do want to be casting this a second or two early so that you keep full up times, but when you're beaming, and we'll talk about this more in the parse section, when you're beaming, you know, you, you sometimes will let dots fall off and that's okay, and even more so on this build. And then after that, 
that we have Camouflage Hunter. So this is kept for the passive. Again, just like the Barb Trap from our Fighter's Good Skill line, there's passives that increases our weapon and spell damage just for it being on our bar. Uh, the other thing is that Major Savagery. So with this build, because we want these passives, because we mostly want to be beaming, and if we put on more dots, it means less time beaming, and most of our damage comes from the beam. So again, everything's about the beam. So we put this on the bar for our passives. The benefit, though, is because we're actually going to be getting Major Savagery and Major Brutality, which are the same buffs you would get from like weapon damage, the expensive weapon damage potions. So you can actually either use trash potions with this build, or if you're a little bit more on the sweaty side, you can of course use heroes and potions, which are very expensive, but um, you can just use trash potions and that's just as optimal because you're going to be getting all of the buffs you would normally get um, already included in this build. And then after that we have Flawless Dawnbreaker. Now this ultimate, generally speaking, is just here again for the Fighter's Killed Skill passives. So we just have it on our bar. You can use it if you are doing a parse, for example, and you're not going to get enough ultimate to use our more expensive, the Languid Eye that we're going to have in our back bar, which is the better ult, what you normally want to be using. But if you're not going to get enough ult before the parse is done or before the fight is done, you can go ahead and use Flawless Dawnbreaker for a little bit extra damage. Now moving on to our back bar here. So again, we have another like kind of flex spot for our weapon skill line. I have here wall of elements. So we're using an inferno staff and then daggers on the front bar. You could also use a two hander, just whatever the skill is that would make sure that you keep your uh, enchantment procced on your back bar. That's the skill you wanna have here. After that, we have fulminating ruin. Fulminating Ruin is really nice because it provides synergy for three other people in our group. And in addition to just allowing them to get back resources, it also increases damage. So it's a good DPS ability. And then the extra synergies are really nice. Uh, after that, we have kind of a, a flex spot here. So if you're actually in content, I recommend what I have here at the top, which is Crux Weave Armor. And the reason for that is because when you, whenever you take damage, you have the skill active every, I think, four or four and a half seconds, it gives you, I'll pop it up on the screen, uh, it'll give you a crux back. And remember that we want three crux every single time, and then as soon as we get three crux, we beam. If we have a couple dots that are about to fall off, we might refresh them, but other than that, we beam. And so you can actually get crux, and you can beam and get back enough crux sometimes, if, if the timing works out just right, to be able to then beam almost immediately again. You might not even have to cast another skill, or at least it'll save us you know, one cast or maybe two of our Cephaliarx Flail, depending on how we're refreshing our dots and what have you. Now, obviously, if you're on the trial dummy, you can't do that. So to get a decent parse, uh, or to get a good parse, I recommend just going with Mage's Guild Ruin in this position. You could do any other flex skill here if you wanted, but in contrast, Content, generally speaking, Crux Weaver armor is what you want to go with. And keep in mind that there are fights that you can take a little bit of damage if you try to. <laughs> so you can actually kind of play like a little bit of a mini game to take a little bit of damage to make sure you're constantly generating this Crux if you're in a fight where you might not otherwise do that. Now, obviously, don't you know, kill yourself trying to do that. <laughs> but there's most fights, most uh, organized group events, and obviously anytime you're solo, you can you can use a skill and you'll it'll help you generate crux. The other thing about it, it'll also provide you with major resolve, which will reduce your damage taken by 9%, which is a pretty big deal, honestly, uh, all things considered. And when you have that and the minor evasion on the front bar, you get a pretty tanky build, all things considered. Uh, after that, we have another skill that's going to help us with our crux generation. These are the two main ones that we have on our back bar, and that's going to be Inspired Scholarship. The other benefit of Inspired Scholarship is it provides us with that major brutality and also major sorcery, but we're stacking kind of stamina-based things, and that is what increases our... Uh, our weapon and spell damage by 20%, and that's what we would normally get from our weapon damage potions or spell power potions. So, and it works when we, no matter what bar we're on. So that's one of the new changes with the new class. They added this new feature, and they've applied it to a few other classes, not really super well, but they <laughs> this has trickled down to some of the other classes just a little bit. But uh, for us, it's really great. We don't need to have it on both bars or anything like that. It'll still provide that benefit. The other thing is it does a decent amount of damage. Uh, it's not amazing, but it's not bad either. But mostly we want it for the Crux generation. And then after that, we have Camel Hunter again. And again, same reason. This provides us with that major savagery. It's also for the passive. The main thing is the passive because we don't want to put another dot here because we want to be beaming most of the time. The other thing 
is it will also provide us with Minor Berserk, which we normally get from Combat Prayer for in group content. But if you're solo, uh, it, this is a really good solo build because it kind of has everything you need, right? You don't need to use expensive potions, which is nice. You can have Major Resolve as part of your build that helps you actually do more damage when you're getting hit. So that's really nice. You, we have Minor Evasion for the AoE damage. Uh, you know, the list kind of goes on and on as far as what this build can do in, you know, solo content. You already have all these buffs. You don't even need Minor Force, which is a single target dot. You could just not use Barb Trap if you're in an AoE fight, if you're running around Overland or something like that. So a lot to recommend this build for all uses and all purposes. Uh, it's going to work really well. But if you do need to self-heal in one of those situations, that's why we have Evolving Rune Mend. Evolving Rune Mend is a, a good heal. It also generates a Crux, which is nice so that we can go ahead and beam more, right? We're all about the beam. And then it also provides a little bit of a heal over time. You could also use any other heal you might like here. I think Evolving Rune Mend for a burst heal and a little bit of heal over time works fairly well. But anything you want, you could, you could put it here. There's not a ton in the Arcanist you know, kit that works really good, but you could use Vigor. Uh, Echoing Vigor is great for group content or Resolving Vigor if you just need it for yourself for solo content. That'll also provide you with a bit of minor resolve, reducing your damage taken. So again, this is your flex spot if you need a heal or if you need something else in your back bar. And because we'll be spending most of our time on the front bar, it's not really a big deal if we lose that major savagery for a few seconds while we're on the back bar. And then after that, our last skill is the Languid Eye. So this is the morph we want to take. This is not the morph that follows somebody around. It stays stationary, but it does a pretty good amount of damage. You can also replace this if you need to, if something happens. Uh, in general, go with the Languid Eye. If you're in a fight, I'm trying to think of like a boss fight that might be particularly mobile, there might be a reason to go with the other morph in certain very niche specific situations. But... Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so we'll just leave it here. The Languid Eye, I think it's the way to go. If you're in PvP or if you're in Overland and where, you know, stuff is going to be moving and you need to move a lot so that you're not taking a bunch of damage, you could use the other morph of this, the Tykeen's Gaze. Nothing wrong with it. It just does a little bit less damage, but it will follow the target around. And that can be nice when you're, whenever you're running around Overland. And that is it for our skills. Now, there are some passives that do some pretty crazy things. Give us a lot of penetration. It gives us a lot of critical damage. Let's go ahead and talk about a couple of those. So one is going to be Faded Fortune. Faded Fortune, what that does is whenever you generate or consume Crux, it increases your critical damage by 12% for 7 seconds. That's pretty big, pretty huge. No other class really has anything that's quite that good. Um, you, you have some things that are pretty close or maybe maybe uh, maybe just as good. But whenever you're generating consuming Crux, we're going to be doing all the time. It's going to help increase our critical damage, which helps us a lot when we're running around solo and not in the optimized group content to make sure we're at the critical cap. The other major passive is Splintered Secrets. So what this does is it increases our penetration by 991 per Herald of the Tomb, which is our DPS skill line ability that we have slotted. So this is going to be our beam, Cephaliarch's Flail, our two back bar dots. So, uh, you know, pretty much uh, uh, most of the skills that we use that are from our class skills are going to be from the skill line. So that gives us, you know, about 2,000, a little bit less, depending on exactly what we do, or a little bit more, uh, but about 2,000 extra penetration, which is, again, really nice for overland content. And of course, you always want to make sure, you know, we've talked about this a lot on the channel, make sure you're at max penetration at all times. That's the most important thing you want to do. And then kind of everything else flowing from that. There are a few other passives uh, from the skill line, some that give you a little bit of magic or stamina recovery or what have you. Most of them, I think all of them are really passive and just kind of work. Um, I don't think it really helps you to know what they do. Those two main ones are the extra critical that you get and the extra penetration you can get uh, from our DPS skill line are the ones that I think are most important and, uh, and, and most, most of note. Uh, also, uh, a quick note for Solo, you could use Pragmatic Fate Carver, which is the other morph of the beam, and it gives you a shield. That could help, especially if you're someone who maybe is less mobile or has you know issues playing the game or whatever. I mean, standing still for four and a half seconds too or not being able to move very fast um, <laughs> does present some challenges too but the other morph will provide you with the shield if you're in a group content though and you have a healer you should not need that morph and I do not recommend that uh, most people use it in any kind of group content and honestly if you can get away with not using it in solo content I would probably do that because the other one does do a significant amount more damage Okay, let's go ahead and move on and talk about gear. So for our optimal setup, what I'm recommending is Pillar of Nern, which drops from Falkreath Hold, 
which is a four person dungeon. You can just run it on normal to get your gear. And then I recommend pairing that with Coral Riptide, which drops some Dread Cell Wreath. You do not need perfected gear. You do not need to run that on vet. You can run it on normal, again, just to collect the gear. So the reason I recommend pairing these two, and, and we're also gonna pair that with the Velothi Urmage Amulet, which is the new one of the newer mythics, and that's on a necklace spot, and then one piece of Slime Crawl, okay? And then our back bar will be a Maelstrom Arena weapon of whatever you decide, so Maelstrom Inferno staff for our like primary build here. Now, the reason that we're going with these sets, okay, so oftentimes you heard me talk about World of Depths and how great it is, it requires us to light attack. And they're gonna be long periods where we're just beaming and we're not light attacking. Also, we, you know, this, this whole build is a little bit, you know, it, it could be really useful for someone who can't light attack very often. And so you don't wanna necessarily get, pair it with a set that you have to light attack. So Coral Riptide is a tricky set. And I normally don't recommend it because you have to keep your stamina very low for it to have the, the best effect, under 33%. However, with this build, I think you're gonna find that it's pretty easy to do. And part of the reason for that is that you don't need to use potions at all right, with this build. You could just not use them. So what you can do is let your stam fall down, because this is more or less a stamina build. It's a hybrid build, but it's predominantly stamina. Let, so you could let your stamina fall down to 33%, and then if it drops down too low where you're struggling to cast abilities, you drink a potion. Again, it might go up a little bit too high, but just don't drink anything until it goes down low enough where you need to again, and you'll get most of the benefit of Coral Riptide without having to do this crazy mini game and, and what have you, and it can be quite annoying. So that's why I actually like Coral Riptide with this build, because the fact that we don't need potions, because when you have to drink potions to get the buffs, it, sometimes it doesn't line up with like, oh, I don't really need more magicka or stamina depending on what set you're using, and it can throw you off, it can be a problem. So with this setup, you really, you don't have to do that. So that's why I like Coral Riptide with this particular build and why I don't like it with most other builds because I think it's too difficult for most people to use. It's a great set, does tons of damage if you can do it. Some people hate the mini game. There's a lot of problems, but uh, if, with this particular build, I actually do recommend it and I found it very easy to parse with and very easy to use. And we're pairing that with Pillar of Nern. The reason we're pairing it with Pillar of Nern is because Pillar of Nern procs off of damage. Any damage done, it will cause it to proc. So we don't have to light attack, um, which is the problem with some of those other sets that we might use, like World of Depths, like uh, Arms of Reliquin and stuff like that. So that's why we like Pillar of Nerd and we're pairing a trial set with a non-trial set, which is almost always the most optimal thing to do because the trial set, that three piece bonus. And then again, the Velothi Urmage, what this does is it reduces the damage of our light attacks but it increases the damage of all of our other abilities. And since with this build, like 40% of our damage is coming from the beam, again, this be build is all about the beam, uh, that's why it works really well with this. The amulet is generally good also, but it's, it works particularly well with this build. And then we just have the one piece of slime crawl for the extra critical damage because we have kind of one piece, we don't know what to do, what, what to do with. And then again, the back bar, any maelstrom weapon will work just fine. For our CP here, we are going with Deadly Aim, Wrathful Strikes, Mastered Arms, and Exploiter. If you don't have someone providing off balance, you do want to swap out Exploiter with something else, but I think most of the time now, off balance is fairly common to have, so I wouldn't really worry about it too much. You could back bar, if you're doing a lot of solo content, you could back bar a, uh, a Lightning Staff if you wanted to, to help, and with your Wall of Elements, to help provide your own off balance if you would like. That could be one option for you, but by and large, any group content. I think off balance is something we typically kind of have in groups now, just kind of by default. It's not always the case, but if you know, unless you're getting really sweaty, <laughs> uh, it's not going to be a problem, right? Unless you're getting really sweaty in a pug that also isn't providing that for you. So I think for the most part, you can leave this CP the way it is, and you really shouldn't need to change it too often. Again, those who are really trying to optimize for every fight, you might find a reason to swap something out. Uh, after that, we have our slottable red CP. Uh, I have some suggestions here. You can honestly do whatever you want, okay, with a red CP. It, it's really choose your own adventure. Rejuvenation is pretty nice for the extra recovery, 
Fortified is nice for the extra armor so that you can, you know, reduce your damage taken and stuff like that. I like the expert evasion for the free roll dodge periodically, especially since we're using a set where we want to keep our stamina low. But again, anything you want to do, celerity is just nice to be able to move faster, especially when we're beaming. But again, anything you want to do with a red CP, it's totally up to you. Uh, the blue CP is designed for a maximum DPS with this setup here. Uh, after that, we have our Thief Mundus. Mundus is kind of the same for everybody, it increases our critical critical strike chance, so that's why we have it. Just It's just what's best for everyone, so that's why we use it. We're stacking into stamina, so of course we have 64 points into stamina, all stamina enchants on all of our gear, and you know, stamina all the way down. <laughs> uh, and then we are stacking, of course, weapon damage, but you know, that kind of most of that stuff is hybridized now, so it's not that big a deal, and we don't have to worry about potions, so even less of a deal for us. If you are new, or if you're just trying to, you know, start out and you want a crafted set, I have several listed here and then one purchasable set. All of these are good. Is one of them better than some of the others? Probably. Uh, Order's Wrath is a really great set. Uh, New Moon, Forest Wraith, these are all going to be good sets. A little bit niche, Forest Wraith, so on. I'll be like, wait, what? <laughs> because it does, you know, most of our damage comes from the beam. Having the extra critical just on our class abilities work actually it works out pretty well but uh if you only had to pick you just pick two of these i'd probably go with orders wrath and new moon if i was going 100 crafted uh but I, th I like forest rate too honestly it could be better um you can also do deadly strike deadly strike is one of those sets that you know really you would think that it would work amazingly well with the arcanist and it does work really well the thing is because we're sometimes on our back bar and we're not getting the benefit of that with pillar of nerd we're always getting the benefit of it basically, because we, it, we almost never miss a chance for it to proc because we're on our back bar so little. Yeah, I, I know you would think that Deadly would be a little bit better and might be up in the top tier, and it's not bad, but I personally find Pillar of Nern and uh, and Riptide to be the, the best pairing here. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with it, and if you wanted to use it in place of Pillar of Nern, you could totally do that. I just found it to be a little bit of a DPS loss. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about parsing. So, on this build, you can go ahead and... and uh, precast inspired scholarship early if you're on the dummy you can go ahead and drop your run a few seconds early as well as your barb trap after that you just kind of go through your rotation i usually start with my back bar get that wall of elements down for the weapon damage enchants move through the rest of our active back bar skills then onto our front bar again get the dots going on then we use our cephaliarch's flail until we have three stacks so we have three triangles floating around us and then we beam as our beams going our inspired scholarship should give us back one more crux so we should have one more triangle floating around us and then if all of our dots are up the rule of thumb that uh, I kind of go with is if there's less than two seconds on a dot or two seconds or less I will go ahead and refresh it if there is more than two seconds on a dot, I will not refresh it before beaming again. So we go into a parse, we pre-buff, we pre-cast all the skills we could, we go ahead and put up all of our dots, we make sure we got three crux, we beam. We might finish our beam and find out that, hey, all of our dots have plenty of time on it. All you wanna do is Cephaliarch's Flail to generate two more crux, Inspired Scholarship will have given us one, and then we beam again. If you have two seconds or less on a particular dot, I will tend to refresh it. And if more than that, I will go ahead and let it fall off. Now, after that, there are kind of, you're dropping dots at different periods of time. You know, there's kind of this question of like, well, there is a priority, which one is best? By and large, the actual damage of each particular skill is is fairly minor. The main thing is the the buffs that that thing provides. So our back bar, our wall of elements, or our stampede, or whatever our, our 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 skill is from that weapon skill line that will keep our back bar infused weapon enchant procked. That's what we want to keep down. So wall of elements, pretty high priority. Basically, any skill that provides us with a buff in addition to the damage is it's doing. So Feliarch's flail, we won't really have to worry about this because we'll be casting it more often than we need to but if for any chance that you know it was about the but the debuff on the target was about to fall off we would want to go ahead and cast Cephaliarch's flail to make sure that we kept that buff up because it's an extra five percent damage which is significant after that inspired scholarship is really nice because while we're beaming it will give us a crux back it'll always proc while we're beaming so that when we finish our beam we only need to generate two more crux so that's kind of higher up on the tier there and then kind of after that it's 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 you know 
kind of whatever you want, I guess. Uh, there is <laughs> there is a right answer to all that, but we're not going to go into that much detail today. I will note that, you know, it did feel very weird letting all these dots fall off fairly regularly with this build, but that's just the way it works, okay? Just kind of go with it. Um, that's why we have less less active skills than we might on some other classes. And then again, just make sure you generate that three crux and then beam and refresh any dots that are about to fall off with a, with a second or two left on them but otherwise you just go ahead and beam and then re-up the dots afterwards so anyways uh, i think that is it for this video it feels like a shorter one i guess we'll see it in editing again a special thanks to lenny and your i really appreciate you guys's help and really everybody there's a lot of people who in the discord who provide help to me you guys providing comments down below let me know if i miss something or if there's something i should add to the next one and uh, I really appreciate that. If you want to get notifications whenever I'm making videos and whenever they're going live, make sure to not only hit the subscribe, but also hit the bell icon. And that'll give you notifications whenever my videos are going live. I've had a lot of people, friends, like close friends recently be like, hey, I, I don't see when your videos are going live. You gotta hit the bell icon so you get notified. But anyways, that's it for today, guys. I appreciate you watching. We'll catch you in the next one.